so let's begin then uh, good morning um, i noticed that there is one more question which someone has put in the uh, google sheet uh, this morning uh, let me just quickly address that question um, before we go forward the question is how does something like thermal pressure provide pressure support against uh, gravity and this is at the heart of a stellar uh, at a static equilibrium so gravity left to itself as i have already mentioned to you yesterday would like to compress things because that force is inwards every particle is attracting every other particle so the the tendency is to minimize the distance between particles so if there is no opposing force then there is no choice but every particle to come together to the most compact form possible and uh, in the cosmic context that will in fact be a black hole however any object can try to resist this kind of catastrophic collapse and this resistance will come from the forces that particles feel which make them go away from each other for example if you take the earth there are coulomb forces between charged particles of like charge let's take two ions or two electrons they have coulomb forces so they will repel and this force of repulsion manifests in a way to produce an outward pressure which can then stop this gravitational contraction and we have a stable earth so when you go to a scale which is as large as the stars this coulomb force is no longer enough but the stars are hot and as you know anything hot has a pressure you take a balloon the gas inside the balloon has a non zero temperature and as a result it has a pressure if you heat up the balloon you will see that the balloon will expand because the pressure goes up but you all know that gas pressure is proportional to the number density times boltzmann constant times the absolute value of temperature so as long as the absolute value of temperature is non zero and there is material and there is always a thermal pressure so this pressure is isotropic so acts in all directions so one has to be a little more careful to say whether a pressure constitutes a force loosely we will always say that the pressure constitutes a force but it actually does imagine in the room that you are sitting in there is air pressure everywhere now hold up a piece of paper in any direction in front of you there is pressure on that piece of paper because there is atmospheric pressure if there is a net force then the paper would move in some direction due to atmospheric pressure but that doesn't happen because pressure on both sides of paper equalize and they cancel each other so therefore there is no net force so net force due to pressure comes only when there is a difference of pressure so the force that we talk about is all about difference of pressure if there is a difference of pressure between inside and outside then there is a net force then you know, the, part, you know, the object will either expand or contract so here also in the stars what you are talking about 
is the fact that the gas inside has finite temperature and therefore it has pressure. But that's not enough. There has to be a change in pressure to provide a force against gravity. So actually what you are looking for is the gradient of pressure. The gradient of pressure must balance gravitation. And when we looked at the hydrostatic equilibrium equation, which we derived yesterday, what you have on the right hand side is the gravitational force. And that is balanced by the gradient of pressure. This is gravitational force of unit volume per unit volume. And this is the gradient of pressure, which gives you the force per unit volume, which is in the other direction. And when you balance these two, then you have a hydrostatic equilibrium. We have talked about spherically symmetric situations. So therefore, the only coordinate along which things can change here is in the radial coordinate. So all derivatives and balances are in the radial direction. So that's my brief answer to the question that was raised. But this is a very fundamental concept. You have to keep it in mind, not just for thermal pressure, but pressure of all kinds. That is a gradient of pressure that leads to a force. And this force, if, for example, we remove gravity, because there is a gradient of pressure, which is now inwards, so that means pressure increases inwards. So the gradient of pressure will push the object outwards, the object will expand because of this gradient of pressure. If uh, <clears throat> gravity was not that, it will expand and explode the object. And gravity, in absence of pressure, will contract the object to a point. When you have a balance, then the object is stable and uh, it stays in one place. <clears throat> so the defined size and shape. Uh, so I see that Bhagwan Kadli has raised hand. Go ahead if you want to ask something. So you have raised hand. Do you have a question? If, if you have a question, please ask. Or put it in the chat box, please. Anyway, so I will address that when uh, I see the question. So we have done this yesterday. And from that, we derived the Virial theorem. And we use the Virial theorem to estimate the central temperature of the sun, and also to describe what happens when a gas cloud uh, contracts, collapses, and uh, in the process of gravitational contraction, it starts getting hotter. And uh, eventually, the central temperature reaches high enough value to uh, ignite hydrogen and you get a star. Now, let us try to go a little bit more in detail. If So there's a question saying, how can we tell that there's a hydrostatic equilibrium? If there was no equilibrium, then the object will either expand or contract. If you see an object holding its shape, then that must be a, there must be hydrostatic equilibrium. So we are talking about cases where the object holds its shape. For example, 
the sun has remained the same shape and size uh, practically for billions of years so uh, so therefore there must be an equilibrium since the this is, i will load this hand for now and ask this question later yeah <clears throat> so let's try to delve a little more deep into a little more detail but not in great detail in order to solve this equation uh, with the um, equation of state let's say we will use thermal equation of state now because we are talking about thermal pressure that is relation between pressure and density and there is a third quantity which we have to relate related to and that is the temperature and this is the simple thermal pressure equation that you are all familiar with so this is <coughs> rho by mu mp is the number density of particles and boltzmann constant and temperature is the pressure so that is the equation of state so one has to solve this but since there is a third unknown quantity which is um, temperature here we need to have additional um, uh, equations in this case equation of radiative transfer to also fix the temperature and usually this has to be solved numerically to get the structure of a star but you know, <clears throat> we will not go to the complicated full solution of these equations we want to get a feel for various dimensional quantities that involve stellar structure the numbers that we will calculate in this kind of very approximate dimensional analysis will not be accurate but the dependencies is what we are looking at and they will be you know, reasonable so let's do some drastic approximation let's say the star has a radius capital r and dp dr will replace it by a linear difference at the surface pressure is zero at the center pressure, pressure is pc so zero minus pc and <coughs> divided by the total radius so let us replace dp dr by 0 minus pc by total radius this is almost assuming that the pressure in, uh, increases linearly from surface to the center then on the right hand side i'm talking about the stellar surface so within that the full mass of star is contained so g capital m capital m is the full mass of the star This small r square is now capital R square. Capital R is the radius of the star. And for rho of r, we just replace it by the average density within the star. That is capital divided by four pi by three r cube. As I said, the numerical values that we will get this way will not be accurate, but you will get reasonable dependencies. of quantities on mass radio so if we now rearrange this you will get pc equal to g by 4 pi g m squared by r4 now instead of r if i write it in terms of rho average density okay and this is proportional to g m to the power of 2/3 density to the power of 4 someone's uh, microphone is not on mute could you please mute it so this 
quantity on the right hand side let's call that gravitational pressure e gra you just invent a name for it so the thermal pressure pc was now balanced gravitational pressure p gra for hydrostatic equilibrium to take place and this thermal pressure pc will have to come from this that is we will have to use the central temperature for it so let's then plot pressure proportional to central temperature times density up i'm plotting here log of central pressure against log of density so in this case for a given temperature log of pressure is proportional to log of density so <coughs> pressure is rho to the power of 1 and this slope is 1 so these lines red lines here will therefore correspond to thermal pressure at different densities for a given temperature let's take a temperature t1 as density increases thermal pressure will also increase so all those points which are connected by the given temperature t1 are on this red line at a higher temperature t2 the dependence of pressure on density will be a line which is parallel to this but at a higher value at another higher temperature again another parallel line at higher value of pressure so that's how thermal pressure will depend on density for different temperatures now let's look at the gravitational pressure which it has to balance which is on the right hand side of this equation that is proportional to mass to the power of 2 thirds and density to the power of 4 thirds thermal pressure has a dependency of rho to the power of 1 gravitational pressure has a dependency of rho to the power of 4 so these slopes are different in log law and just like you had different lines for different temperature over here here you will have p proportional to rho to the power of 4/3 so these are again straight lines in log p log rho but with a slope of 4/3 which is steeper than these red lines and since this is proportional to m to the power of 2/3 as well so as you go to different masses this line will keep moving according to the mass so if you go to higher mass this line will keep moving up so now we have some information where we can pictorially depict approximate equilibrium solutions so when one of these black lines cross one of these red lines you have a equilibrium solution so you can have for example at temperature t1 the mass m1 having a equilibrium solution of this but imagine that there are many many of these lines at different t's right so therefore <coughs> you will always have some intersection and in the, at any given temperature t you will be able to find a uh, uh, intersection which will give you a equilibrium solution in this diagram so what then is the right equilibrium solution in this diagram so let's consider this black line m2 
<clears throat> Let us say at a given point of time, the central temperature has reached T1 and it is in balance. However, let us say that there is no nuclear fusion yet at this temperature. If there is no nuclear fusion at this temperature, then the thermal energy is leaking out and it is not being replenished. That means the total energy is going down. So, if the total energy goes down, as we have seen yesterday from the video theorem, the object will contract. It will release some gravitational energy, half of which will get radiated away, and half of will go towards increasing the thermal energy in the center, in the interior. So, an equilibrium like this, if there is no replenishment of the radiated energy, is not a stable equilibrium. The object will keep moving along this black line because the mass is not changing, but the temperature will change. And at any given point of time, whichever red line crosses it will be the interior temperature. Now, let's say it keeps going, keeps going. And at this point, when the temperature has reached T2, nuclear fusion ignites at the center. And you are now able to balance the outgoing radiation from the surface with the radiation generated inside, the heat generated inside. Once that happens, then in the configuration, the total energy is no longer changing. As the total energy is no longer changing, the object does not need to contract or change its size or shape. And it will remain stable there as long as the energy lost by radiation from the surface is compensated by the energy that is generated inside. So, if that's the situation that obtains for this object with mass M2 at temperature T2, then this will be the equilibrium solution for that star for as long as the nuclear fusion lasts. So this star will be in main sequence with this temperature and with this density. Now I have mentioned to you that the central temperature at which hydrogen ignites in uh, different stars lies within a very small range of value. And that is because the nuclear reaction rate is an extremely sensitive function of temperature. With a small change in temperature, you can change the reaction rate by enormous amount. In some cases, the reaction rate is proportional to temperature to the power of 40. You know? So, with a very minor adjustment in temperature, you can uh, cater to a wide range of energy loss homicides, very large range of homicides. So, by and large, all stars which are at the main sequence have their central temperature within a narrow range. So let's consider this T2 as one such characteristic temperature. And then let's look at objects of different masses. The star of mass M2 will then be on main sequence over here. Star, star of mass M3, which is of higher mass, will be at main sequence over there. So this is funny because as you can see, a star of higher mass will find its equilibrium at lower density. Star of lower mass will find its equilibrium at higher density. And this is indeed true on main sequence. 
We'll come back to this in a moment. So as I've just mentioned, in a hydrogen burning star, the central temperature is roughly equal to the characteristic temperature, characteristic temperature of hydrogen burning, which is about 10 million Kelvin. And if you then represent the intersection of those two lines, as I was showing in the previous diagram, it will be g m to the power of two thirds rho to the power of four thirds, equaling k t h by mu m p times rho. And that gives you density proportional to mass to the power of minus two, which means a star of larger mass as lower central density, as we saw in the intersection diagram. Now, if rho is proportional to m to the minus 2, you can easily uh, turn this around and ask what should the radius be, therefore, as a function of mass. And you will find this means the radius is proportional to mass, right? Because density is proportional to mass over radius cubed. So is mass over m cubed, so that is mass to the minus two. So on main sequence then, the radius of the star is roughly proportional to mass. And the central temperature, which you can see from here, is proportional to mass over radius. Now this is a result that we have re-derived here. We also got the same thing when we applied just the video here. So all the stars which are burning hydrogen, is a large cluster of stars which we call main sequence stars, have central temperature roughly at a similar value of 10 million Kelvin and the radii are roughly proportional to mass. Now let's ask uh, what their luminosity must be, how bright would they be, how much radiative energy is going to be released per unit time by stars on main sequence. So luminosity L, that is the amount of radiation escaping per unit time, can be roughly estimated by taking the total radiative energy content with the star and dividing it by the effective radiation escape time. The total radiative energy content within the star approximate value of that is the radiation constant A times temperature to the power of 4, which is the radiative energy per unit volume, times the volume of the star. Right? So it is proportional to A t to the power of 4 times R cubed. Radiation escape time is something that we can compute from the, from the photon mean free path. Let's say a photon can fly freely for a distance L. After that, it encounters an ion or an electron, and then it gets deviated, and then it goes in another direction. And on an average, it travels another distance L before encountering another obstruction. So, if the total size of the star R is some number capital N times L, then because of this random walk, a photon will take about capital N square 
number of such flights to escape. So capital N is uh, radius divided by the mean free path. This is N, now it's N squared. And at average flight time within each of these free paths is the length of the free path divided by C. So the typical radiation escape time is R by L squared times L by C, which is R, R squared divided by LC. And the mean trip of L is related to the uh, interaction cross section of photons, that is sigma, and the number density of particles, one by n sigma, which can also be written in terms of what the in astronomy called opacity, which is this is cross section per unit mass. So that is kappa. Since it is per unit mass, then this n is now put as mass density rho, one by rho. So using this, then we see that the luminosity will therefore be the radiative energy content that is a to the power of four r cube divided by r squared by LC, which is this number, which is um, proportional to a times c times t to the power of four times r times the mean free path. And in main sequence, then the luminosity will be proportional to. I can take this T to be the characteristic hydrogen burning uh, temperature at the, in the interior. So T is the same for all the main sequence stars, roughly the same at this approximation. So then it is simply proportional to L times R others being constant. And since R is proportional to M, it is proportional to L, L times M. So now let's look at how L behaves. When the stars are very high mass and the temperature is high, the entire interior is fully ionized, the main capacity comes from Thomson scattering. And for Thomson scattering, kappa is a constant quantity. If kappa is a constant quantity, then we have L is proportional to 1 over rho, which is proportional to r cubed over M. So if I include this over here, so L becomes proportional to capital L becomes proportional to R cube, and R being proportional to M, the velocity becomes proportional to Q of one. Whereas in lower mass stars, where ionization is not complete, the more complicated absorption and re-emission mechanisms come into play. You would have uh, already listened to the lectures on radiative processes, and you would have heard about thermal Brunstrahlung, free free absorption. And when free free absorption dominates, the opacity becomes a function of temperature and density, and the corresponding mean free path can be written as capital T, that is temperature to the power of seven halves divided by rho squared. Now here again, I would consider the temperature of all main sequence stars to be similar. So you know, we will drop this dependence, but you will have one over rho squared. And when you put that in, in this uh, relation, you will have the luminosity proportion to m to the power of five. So for stars typically lower than the, lower mass than the sun, the 
The dependence of luminosity on mass is roughly mass proportional to mass to the power of five. And for higher mass stars, it's <coughs> roughly mass to the power of three. So now on average, one can say that luminosity is proportional to mass to the power of four. But this gives us something interesting that <coughs> as the star becomes more massive, its energy loss rate or energy production rate, which it loses to the surroundings, increases by a very large amount. It is not linear with mass, but it's proportional to almost fourth power of mass. Which means they are consuming fuel much faster than a star of a lower mass because all this escaping radiation has to be balanced by the fusion reaction at the center. However, the amount of fuel available is proportional to the mass of the star itself. So, if you burn the fuel much faster, the duration of this phase will be correspondingly shortened. You take a fuel reserve, which is proportional to mass, and fuel consumption rate, which is proportional to mass to the power of four, then you end up with a main sequence lifetime, TMS which is roughly proportional to 1 over m cubed. That means a higher mass star will stay on the main sequence for a much shorter time than a lower mass star. A star which is 10 times the mass of the sun will complete its main sequence phase in 1,000th the time compared to the sun. Is a big difference. Okay, so now we can uh, put all these pieces of information together to create a theoretical Hospung Russell diagram where our uh, horizontal axis is effective temperature and uh, the vertical axis is luminosity. What I've shown here is a diagram which comes from detailed computation of stellar models, not the approximate uh, dimensional analysis we did. So this has um, all effects, minor effects included. But we are just looking at the general trends. We note that luminosity is proportional to roughly mass to the power of four, radius is roughly proportional to mass, mass, and uh, therefore the temperature, the luminosity is proportional to T effective to the power of four times R squared. So um, T effective to the power of four is roughly proportional to M squared, which means the luminosity and temperature will have a relation on the main sequence. and uh, that is, if you strictly follow this, it will come out to be temperature to the power of eight. But in real calculation, you will find that you know, the temperature depends a little more, you know, not just m square. So this gives you T effective proportional to m to the power of half, but T effective rises a little faster and luminosity rises a little slower. So you know, in reality, in the main sequence, it is roughly luminosity proportional to temperature to the power of six. And that is this part of the diagram will have that slope. And uh, so, by and large, the simple physics that you have described uh, explains why the stars. Are found in a narrow band in the Hirschsprung Russell diagram, that is, in the effective temperature luminosity diagram. And that is because 
stars spend most of their time burning hydrogen to helium. That is the longest phase of their life. So therefore, most of the stars are to be found in that phase. And when they are in that phase, they follow this relation because of um, uh, hydrostatic and radiation balance. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's a little bit of time in which I will now introduce a source of pressure which is not thermal pressure. And this becomes important in the late phases of evolution of these stars and also in describing remnants of stellar evolution which are called compact stars. You will have lecture specifically for compact stars later, but I will just touch upon it, but I will introduce the concept of what we call degeneracy pressure, because that is also important for understanding the evolution of stars. So let's uh, talk about this concept of degeneracy pressure. Now, you would have all learned that electrons are elementary particles with half integral spin, h cross by 2. And such particles obey Fermi Dirac statistics. And Fermi Dirac statistics leads to Pauli's exclusion principle. What does it say? That it says that. In any given quantum state, you can have only one such electron present. So if you have a quantum state which is defined by uh, linear momenta energy and so on, then in each such quantum state, if you now add the spin quantum number, then you can have at most two. You have two different electrons of opposite spin in any quantum state. So what, what quantum state are we talking about when uh, electrons are freely uh, allowed to move about in a given volume, let's say within a star or in a box? So there are no bound states, let us say. So you don't have something like uh, an atom where electrons uh, occupy certain allowed discrete states and so on. So in this kind of uh, free continuum situation, how do we define quantum states? And those of you who have done statistical mechanics would have come across this already that we can describe the state of the electron in what we call phase space. If you are in a three-dimensional volume, then you have three space dimensions and three momentum dimensions. And in this six-dimensional space, the position of each electron is unique at any given point of time. And in this six dimensional volume, we can now construct what we call cells of uh, quantum states. Each phase space cell of volume Planck constant cube would constitute one quantum state. And they will all be adjacent to each other. Since there is no uh, 
discrete bound state there is nothing uh, forbidden in terms of uh, momenta to be occupied we have uh, quantum states which fill the entire phase space and each state is of volume hk now each such phase space cell may contain at least uh, at most two electrons of opposite spin according to pauli exclusion principle so now let us consider a certain volume of phase space and certain finite number of electrons which are distributed within that and let's not even consider any temperature or anything like that let's consider everything at absolute zero now i cannot easily draw a six dimensional phase space so i illustrate this by a one dimensional case where x is the position coordinate and t is the momentum coordinate so in this two dimensions i have now divided this phase space into small square cells of volume h cube and each of these can contain at most two electrons of opposite spin so lower the momentum lower the energy of course so um, as the system always prefers to go to the lowest possible energy and we are talking about zero temperature let's see where we can put the electrons and this is the boundary of x because that is the size of the box so you can't have states to the right of this so i have a certain finite number of phase space cells at the lowest possible momentum and i put two electrons each in each of these phase space cells but then by the time i reach here i still have electrons left so now i cannot put those electrons at this level of momentum anymore because uh, i have to find phase space cells within this phase space volume where i do not push more than two electrons in any such cell so that causes me to put the next set of electrons at a higher level of momentum and the next set of electrons at an even higher level of momentum so even though i did not impart momentum by heating an electrons or anything like that just because of this finite size of configuration space which the electrons has to have to occupy they will also acquire a non zero significant momentum in order to occupy phase space cells according to pauli's exclusion principle so now let us consider squeezing this suppose i push the boundary inwards then what will happen is the number of such states available at any given momentum level goes down even further so electrons will keep moving up in momentum so as we keep squeezing the boundary in configuration space electrons will keep moving up in momentum which means the denser the material gets the higher the momentum passes so if you make the material very dense you are going to get a considerable number of electrons moving at very high speed simply because of pauli's exclusion principle and once electrons have momentum they have pressure so let's say we have 
uh, number of electrons per unit volume being uh, n sub e and the momentum up to which we have had to fill the states let's call that p f the number of phase space cells within that is 4 pi by 3 p f cube by h cube because the configuration space volume is 1 and this must be any by 2 because each cell will contain 2 electrons so the value of pf itself is related to the number density as shown by this equation so pf becomes proportional to any to the power of 1 third and the pressure then is the flux of momentum which is proportional to any times the velocity of these electrons times p so this is the momentum flux carried by the electron population now depending on what v is it gives us a relationship between pressure and density if v is much less than c then v can be written as momentum divided by the mass of the electron so it's p by any so then this then becomes proportional to any times p squared p is proportional to any to the power of one third so this is any times any to the power of two thirds so it becomes proportional to any to the power of five thirds however if the squeezing gets so hard that this velocity reaches the speed of light then v does become c and it, it does not have any further any dependence on momentum so then this becomes a constant and you have any times p but p is proportional to any to the power of one third so pressure becomes proportional to any to the power of four thirds so for a relativistic gas to have one relationship and for non relativistic gas you have another relationship and since any is proportional to density divided by mu e and p we are talking about electron pressure here so degen so this degeneracy pressure is proportional to density to the power of five thirds when it's non relativistic density to the power of four thirds when it is relativistic we will see how this plays a very important role in stellar equilibrium Oh, we will start from here in the next lecture. And that's all for today. Let's take some questions. Mass energy conservation is always followed. Uh, energy conservation, of course, is the total energy that is the um, energy that remains within the configuration and the energy that escapes to the um, outside world. In the log p versus log rho graph, since p is directly proportional to rho, shouldn't the t lines have a greater slope? No, because p is directly proportional to rho in one case, and the p is proportional to rho to the power of four thirds. In the other case, so uh, p is proportional to rho has a slope of one, and p is proportional to rho to the power of four thirds has a slope of one point three three. So that is certainly will have a greater slope. M lines will have slope of one point three three, and the T lines have a slope of one. Opacity, as I mentioned, is just the Um, um, scattering or absorption cross section per unit mass that is the definition of opacity wherever photons interact with material it gives rise to opacity um, photon can be scattered by an electron or be absorbed um, all of that leads to opacity energy and luminosity luminosity is amount of energy escaping per second sir so in the energy 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in calculate uh, in giving the expression for luminosity, uh, yes. the 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 time for photons to reach on the surface. Yes. You mentioned about some r by l whole square factor. Correct. It's some square of some n square or something. I didn't Correct. get that. Yes. What is so? Suppose the you know, photon is not stopped by anything. Then to propagate through a distance r, it will just take. Uh, uh, r by c time, right? We will go straight out. But since the motion is by a random walk, it will go it will take a small step l at each time, and then go in another direction, and then take another small step l, then uh, go in yet another direction. So uh, in random walk. we know that the amount of propagation that happens is proportional to the square root of the number of steps so after n steps you have proceeded to an extent which is uh, equal to square root of n times the length of each step so therefore to get to the whole distance you need to take The number of steps, which is proportional to square root, proportional to square of the number of uh, the square of the uh, ratio of the number, which is the full distance by the individual step. So that n squared times the individual steps will now take you to full r. This is simple random walk. Thank you, sir. How can you imagine a six-dimensional phase space? I mean, uh, it, it is nothing but um, uh, generalization of your three-dimensional coordinate system. So, um, you have to let your imagination <laughs> describe. Any n-dimensional space, six dimension is not that many. Yeah, so um, degeneracy pressure, I will you know, touch upon it again in the next lecture. I will not you know, go over it again now. question also i will address later as to what happens when the material inside becomes relativistic it will not necessarily become a yeah so this uh, the uh, last question that is the direct message to me i will not going Not going to answer it because it is not related to what we talked about. Okay, so let me see if uh, if there are questions in the Google Sheet. No further questions in the Google Sheet. No, okay, there is no. No, so this exoplanet question I'm not going to answer. Uh, that doesn't relate to. The material I'm talking about. Okay. Are there any no, other questions? Uh, if you want to raise hand and ask. Hello, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, my question, my first question is that, uh, uh, what is the actual meaning of gravitational pressure? How can we interpret in uh, in any body? Oh, gravitational pressure is something that we just gave it a name, right? We just concocted something. This quantity on the right hand side, just for a mnemonic, we call it gravitational pressure. This is a combination of mass and density, g m to the power of two thirds, rho to the power of two thirds. So this is basically the central pressure. 
in any gravitationally bound system. Uh, and this needs to be balanced by uh, other sources of pressure for equilibrium. So um, uh, you can imagine a sphere of mass m radius r. Cut it up into two hemispheres and then look at the gravitational force between these two hemispheres and distribute the force over the cross section, which is uh, pi r squared. Then you will get to the same number. Okay, Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now I understand. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you, sir. There is uh, there is one more uh, hand raised, Dwij Brambat. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. For example, in this case, I'm sorry, your voice is not coming through very well. It's very faint. I'm sorry. Uh, am I audible now? Hello. It, it, ah, okay, it's somewhat better. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, sir, actually, uh, in this, uh, for example, in this case, we assume that uh, in the stars, we assume fermions. And uh, they were actually giving us some kind of pressure because of the Pauli exclusion principle. Yeah. What would happen if we have bosons? Bosons, if you have, um, if you have atoms made of bosonic particles, or if you have a star which is full of only bosonic particles, then this will of course not apply. You will, actually, you will have no degeneracy pressure and um, there will be no other source than um, uh, thermal excitations and other uh, interparticle forces if such um, uh, bosons have any interaction between them. Only that will, uh, will give you any pressure, but degeneracy pressure will not exist. Okay, so can we assume that in that case it becomes a black hole? But we know that in material we know is made of, made of electrons and protons. Right. Um, <laughs> they are all fermions. So, yeah. um, bosons will be a conjecture. We, we don't know of any such things. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. In all cases, we take log of values and then graph accordingly. Because we are trying to look at, trying to represent relationships which are power laws. For example, here I am trying to represent a relationship where pressure is proportional to density to the power of four times. So I need to bring this power into the slope. The only way we can do that is by taking logs. So our most convenient way to do that is by taking logs. So that's why we take logarithms because we are looking at um, the slopes um, of these power law relationships. All right, if there are no further questions, then I will stop here today. Um, okay. Yeah, so if there is zero pressure on the surface, then what can you say about temperature at the surface? The so temperature is finite, density is zero. Um, density drops to zero at the surface. So um, surface temperature is what we measure. For example, in case of the sun, the surface temperature is 5,700 degrees. But um, uh, the pressure will go to zero because density will fall. Right, Vivek Verma, go ahead. What is the fraction of the density pressure for gravitational pressure with thermal pressure? Sorry, I How could not understand. How much thermal pressure balance the gravitation? No, no, I did not understand. Sir, I mean, how much thermal pressure? Yeah. How much thermal pressure? Hello? Yes. Yes, how much thermal pressure and how much degeneracy pressure balances the gravitational pressure? 
We will come to that when we uh, talk about where degenerative pressure is important. We will not talk about mixed cases, but uh, we will we will touch upon it at some point. But uh, there are cases where degenerative pressure will be the most dominant uh, pressure, and there will be cases where thermal pressure is the most dominant pressure, and there will be some cases in between which are very interesting, which we will mention as we go along. Just wait for the next two lectures. Thank you. <clears throat> you you uh, calculated the some temperature from varial theorem so, uh, around 10 raised to 7 Kelvin. Yes. Is it core temperature or the average temperature? Yeah, so um, it is in that approximation, it is the average temperature. But the average temperature is dominated by the core temperature because the core is the um, core temperature is the highest. Okay, thanks. All right. So, thank you very much. I will stop now. We'll start here tomorrow.